Our next speaker is also a member of the Federal Reserve System. He is the first Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He has responsibilities which I think are unenviable because he, they include everything that the bank does. And um, I can understand um, uh, his time pressure. So I appreciate very, very much his um, willingness to come and participate in the Minsky Conference. Mr. Feldman has been at the bank since 1995, and he's held progressively um, <coughs> positions of more and more responsibility. He is a, um, he's a member of a number of, um, of um, institutions, uh, non-profit institutions, and he's also one of the primary um, advisors to the monetary policy for the FS for the preparation of the FOMC. He's a, uh, <clears throat> he's a graduate of the uh, University of Wisconsin with honors, and also he has an MPA from a neighboring university. Neighboring, you know, the question of distance now is sort of difficult. You know, Syracuse is, we would call a neighbor, but not quite neighbor, but you know, you can do it, I guess, if you drive fast very, very quickly. Um, so he is um, he's someone who has been involved in supervision, regulation, and I'm sure what he has to tell us will be very, very interesting, especially with um, Minsky and ideas of uh, financial structure challenges. So please join me in welcoming Ron Feldman. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm really glad that when I was at Syracuse, I never took a trip over to Bard because <laughs> I would have been sort of depressed already with what Syracuse is like. I don't know if you've been there or not. It's, uh, it's very cloudy and a little bit run down. And then you come here on a day like this, and it would be, uh, it'd be really hard to drive back. So I, I, that was a wise decision. Um, before I say anything else, and I apologize if someone is from Syracuse here and I've just insulted you <laughs> right off the bat, that wasn't my intent. Let me, let me, uh, let me give a caveat that I need to give that uh, President Bolo doesn't need to give. So these are going to be my views, and they're not the views of anyone else. Um, I want to be really clear about that because I'm going to talk about uh, too big to fail and issues of financial regulation and supervision. And just to be reiterate, so the Board of Governors has authority to write rules, issue rules, and determine what the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve is doing in the areas of regulation. And I don't have that. That's not what we do at Reserve Banks, and I don't want anyone to confuse any of my views <coughs> with what their views are. Um, so I, I titled this uh, talk today, uh, The Four Questions of Too Big to Fail. So for those of you who are getting ready for your first Seder on Friday, I hope that sort of <laughs> ring, rings a bell. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you'll just have to go on Google and, and, and figure that out. I told my son I was going to call it that, and he said, well, what if no one laughs? Said, well, <laughs> it'll be like most of my jokes, so it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, so there, so the other time, I apologize for any more Passover references that I make as I, as I get ready. Uh, okay, so um, what am I going to say? So what are the, I'm going to go through, basically, um, so I appreciate the generous uh, introduction, so let me take a step back here. So I've been working on the too big to fail issue, uh, more or less of my entire career at the Fed, and even before that, in that prior job I had. My sort of one claim to fame, uh, if I have one, is Gary Stern and I wrote a book published by Brookings in 2004 called uh, Too Big to Fail, Too Big to Fail, The Hazards of Big Bail Bank Bailouts. I think I don't remember the exact title now. Um, and in that book, what, we, what did we do? We argued that uh, banks were becoming too big to fail, that it was going to be a big problem if they got in trouble. We sort of identified the uh, issues around why they were getting too big to fail. Uh, let me give you advice, two bits of advice based on that experience. First of all, don't write a book. Uh, <laughs> that's a very, it's extremely inefficient way of making a point. Uh, I would focus on op-eds and <laughs> maybe a pamphlet, but I would definitely not write a book. And if you're going to get something right, like sort of calling the financial crisis and that large banks were going to get the center of it, I would not do that four years in advance. I would definitely do that like six months in advance. So those are two things I learned from there. But, uh, but uh, I also learned a couple other things, and they're sort of morphing into uh, more recent work that the Minneapolis Fed has done on Too Big to Fail. So I'm going to focus, some of the comments are going to be informed by this prior work, and some of them are going to be informed by a specific plan that we put forward about how we think we ought to solve Too Big to Fail. Uh, okay, so let's 
start here with the first question. So the first question is, why is too big to fail so hard to solve? This is, um, this is important. It's important to really start with, uh, with this question. Um, because I think if you don't have an understanding about why it's been so hard to solve, then you're likely to keep repeating sort of the, the approaches we've taken to date, uh, which in our estimation haven't worked. So the short answer is credibility. Credibility is the, is the center for why this is a hard problem. And I was going to use the word time consistency or time inconsistency, but I thought, well, I don't know the audience, maybe they'd be too technical. I obviously hadn't uh, sat through Jim's presentation yet, because uh, <laughs> I probably would have been more open to the fact that this is an audience that's capable of, of, uh, of diving into the details here. So I think for those of you who don't already know, but let me just sort of repeat it. So the classic issue of time consistency is that you make a promise uh, at time t, you make a promise today that you're going to do something, and then you come to the time in which you're going to have to fulfill your promise, and then you don't. Right, that's time. That's a that one uh, someone who got the Minneapolis Fed a Nobel Prize. Uh, that that insight. Uh, it's critical in everything that we're doing, and it's really critical with we're about too big to fail. The issue of why too big to fail is so hard of a nut to crack is every government almost always commits to not bailing people out. They commit to maybe bailing people in. They make all sorts of commitments. At the time that they have to make good on that commitment, it's it's going to be optimal. Uh, when they're in the middle of a crisis, not to make good on it. I want to repeat that. So sometimes people will say, well, they're not making good on it because of a lot of reasons that maybe run the gamut of uh, corruption or cronyism or things like that. I'm making a different argument. At the time that you are in the middle of a financial crisis, it is a mistake to try to make good on some of those things. That's the problem. You're almost always going to make things worse. Now, we can talk <coughs> in a group about uh, different ways that you can provide bailouts. But once you've gotten to something where, um, where you're in that situation, bailout is the right decision. You shouldn't go forward with something else. So that's, that's, that's a really critical point here. Um, and that's going to sort of lead into how we think about the issue is that you want to put yourself in a position where you don't, where bailing out is not the optimal. That's what you want to do. And that's why in this sort of long book that we wrote, uh, not that long, I don't want to dissuade you from buying it, but um, you know, in the relatively short, pithy book that we wrote, uh, <laughs> one, one of the things that we were talking about was, in the US for a long time, the position was, uh, the way that we'll get, avoid too big to fail is we'll, we'll make a verbal commitment that we're not gonna do it, and we'll set up a sort of arduous process by which bailouts uh, have to, um, the process by which you have to approve a bailout. So in the US, you'd have to get the, uh, I don't know if people know, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has a board, the Board of Governors has a board, and there were various rules that said you have to go to the board of the FDIC, you have to go to the board of the governors, you have to get approval from the Treasury Secretary, and the whole idea was, boy, that's going to be such a pain and so hard and so public, no one will go ahead and do that, right? But if you think about it, that's, why would that change the likelihood that you're going to find yourself in the middle where you have to make this decision? It's not going to change that. The only thing that's going to change and make anything credible is you have to change the circumstances on the ground such that you don't need to give a bailout. I'm just going to repeat this because oftentimes you'll hear people say even things like, you should have a constitution amendment that says no bailouts. A constitution amendment doesn't change the fact that when you are the chair of the Board of Governors and you're the Secretary of Treasury and you're the Congress, that when you're going to get to a situation that looks like it's a financial crisis, your best the decision you're going to make is to provide a bailout. That doesn't change that. So that's, that's, that's really creed. That, I mean, that, I'm just going to repeat that. That is incredibly important to explain why too big to fail <coughs> is such a hard problem to, to crack. That's separate from whether we should solve it, right? I'm just going to, I'm going to sort of take as a give. That, I only wanted four questions because you have you know, this thing is four questions in Passover, so I didn't include it, but I'll just, I'll throw in a fifth question right now. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's gravy for you, all of you. Um, should we try to solve it? Um, uh, why, why is it a problem? What are we worried about? You know, um, in the Fed, during the crisis, one thing that was sort of a big argument about, so some people say, well, you need to solve this because there's too much risk taking and bailouts lead to moral hazard, which is gonna create more. So the problem of you give insurance, it's gonna lead to more risk taking and bailouts are gonna encourage more risk taking in the future. There were people in the Fed that used to have these big arguments, and I'll just sort of, uh, these are all public, so uh, at the time, Jeff Lacker was at the Richmond Fed, uh, was sort of a moral hazard absolutist, and Tim Geithner was the famous for saying, you know what, you're not gonna put out a fire, you know, because, because you're worried it's gonna uh, encourage more fire, fires. So this <coughs> idea was, well, I'm not worried about moral hazard. 
you know, in retrospect, that's a very silly argument, right? Because the people who are worried about moral hazard are worried about too much risk taking. If you ask the other people, what are you worried about? What they'll say is that there's externalities associated with the bank failure. So what it is, is if you're running a large bank, you're not gonna take account of the fact that your risk taking is gonna imperil <coughs> somebody else. So you're gonna take on more risk than you would otherwise. Everyone sort of does that, so you get more risk taking. At the end of the day, those arguments, they, they lead you to the exact same place, right? Which is that you're worried about too much risk taking at banks and you wanna take uh, action to prevent that. So why did I add this fifth question? That also takes you to the fact that whatever you're gonna to do to address too big to fail, it has to involve changes in what banks are doing right now. You wanna get at the fact that bank risk taking and somehow reduce that. Okay, so that was the first question. So why is this hard to solve? It's hard to solve because you're gonna promise, but if you don't do something to change what's gonna happen, then you're gonna find yourself exactly back in the situation where giving a bailout makes sense. Okay, so in the, U in the US, uh, we have done something. Um, so we've done, I'm gonna call it DFA, I apologize, I wanted to put these things on one, uh, one line. So it's Dodd-Frank. Uh, do Dodd-Frank type reforms end too big to fail? Uh, and I put type reforms because sometimes people talk a lot about Dodd-Frank. Well, you know, there's things that are technically in Dodd-Frank, there's things that the Basel Committee did that we adopted here, there's things we did under our own authority. Um, I'm talking about the whole constellation of reforms. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna call them Dodd-Frank for simplicity, but you know, they're not all technically. I know there was lawyers in the room, so I don't want anyone to get worked up that I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, uh, you know what was done under the Federal Reserve Act versus what was done under Dodd-Frank. Um, okay, so what, and what am I talking about? So what did Dodd-Frank do? Uh, for those of you who haven't thought about it a little bit. So first thing it did was it raised the amount of equity funding that uh, large banks, the largest banks have to hold. I'm also using banks and bank holding companies sort of interchangeably. I'm really talking about bank holding companies, but it's sometimes it's just easier to say banks. Um, so they have to hold more equity. Second, they have to, have to be able to, uh, uh, they have to be more liquid, and there's different ways that they have to do that, but largely they have to hold more liquid assets, and they have to sort of match their liabilities and assets better than they have in the past. There were changes that were described before around sort of uh, particular kinds of instruments in financial markets and clearing and things of that nature. Um, and then there was big changes that were supposedly done about um, how, to, how to allow these institutions to be uh, easier to resolve. And that's the quote unquote living will provisions. And obviously Dodd-Frank did much more than that. It did things on the consumer side, it did things around housing, et cetera. But for what we're talking about here, if you read Dodd-Frank and you ask people, what did Dodd-Frank do? If you ask the people who, who, who are now more confident we've addressed too big to fail than I am, they'll say those things. More capital, liquid, easier to resolve, and sort of the financial instruments and plumbing that goes around is now more effective. Um, and there's one other thing that's really, really critical, and it's why, uh, and let me say, all those things were in the right direction. So I'm supportive of all those things, and if you go back and read this 2004 book, you'll see uh, some of those things directly, and you'll see hints of some of it as well. But totally essential to the fact that this is gonna work is something that's called TLAC. So that's total loss absorbing capacity. So just show of hands, how many of you have heard of TLAC? You know what that is? Okay, so, so TLAC, uh, and TLAC is the Achilles heel. TLAC is the part of this whole set of reforms that in our view is not gonna work and it's gonna put us exactly back in the position we were today. So what is TLAC? And we, uh, the gentleman who was the, and I apologize if this didn't get, get the name, I don't wanna mispronounce it. Um, the gentleman from Cyprus talked about bail-in debt. So TLAC is sort of a, is a, is a version of bail-in debt. So TLAC, what it says is, we're gonna estimate how much uh, financial resources a financial institution needs to absorb losses. And then they're gonna, banks are gonna have to hold that amount of financial resources in the US, they can hold that in two ways. They can hold some of it as equity, and the rest can be debt. And the debt is just gonna be sort of plain vanilla, uh, I guess like five year kind of debt, and there's some rules around it, but it's basically just uh, a kind of debt. And the idea is, uh, it is debt, and the idea is that when these institutions go and get resolved, that debt will become the equity of the firm that is the successor firm. So I'm gonna repeat this, because this is like, this is the essence of it, so if you're not with me on this, then it's this whole thing I flew out here for no reason, <laughs> other than to enjoy a great day. It snowed, it snowed a week ago in, in Minneapolis, and a week ago in Minneapolis, so it's just wonderful to be here under any circumstances. But um, a TLAC is the, is the essential part. When, when JP Morgan is gonna, so when, the, when, the, when, um, when TLAC was proposed in the US, the Federal Reserve made an estimation that they should hold 
uh, as a risk-weighted basis, 23.5% of their assets in equity and debt, roughly split half and half. Um, and the idea, again, is if J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Co. had to go into, had to be resolved, the new successor entity that gets created is going to be capitalized right away. It's going to be capitalized by taking all of the bondholders and making them equity holders. That's how it's going to work. So why is that important? That's why you don't have bailout. The, the bondholders today become the equity holders of the future, and then you don't need to tax anybody. It's all, all over here. That is, we can talk about all these other things that they did. This is the linchpin for how we're going to avoid bailouts. Okay, so now this explains why I'm sort of emphasizing this credibility stuff. Because just to repeat, the plan is, in the middle of a financial crisis, where you may have J.P. Morgan in trouble, and State Street, and maybe U.S. Bank, and maybe Zions Bank, what you're going to do is you're going to convert the debt holders right away of J.P. Morgan Chase, you're going to convert them into equity holders. I'll just repeat. Our plan, coming off of the financial <laughs> crisis, where we were unwilling to impose losses on fixed income holders, is to impose losses on fixed income holders. <laughs> and I don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think I'm, I'm not making that up. I mean, that's, that's what the plan is. Um, and to repeat a little bit more, so for some of you who've been around, so I've been working on this issue for, um, I'm going to age myself. Uh, if the rest of my body hasn't already done that for you. Um, you know, I remember when there was a big push to have something called subordinated debt. And the idea was that we were going to have debt that was uh, we were going to require all financial institutions, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, big banks, they were going to issue debt that was going to be subordinated. Um, so it was going to be low on the, it was going to be above equity, but, and, uh, but it was going to absorb the losses. And actually, we had an experiment in the United States. We said that Fannie and Freddie were going to have to, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were going to have to issue subordinated debt. They were a test case. So how many people here, how many people here were holding subordinated debt of Fannie and Freddie during the financial crisis? Any of you? Okay. You, okay. Did you take any losses? Sure. No, you didn't. <laughs> Those, you would, maybe if you had sold it at the wrong time, but if you held on, you would have been fine. Why? Because the debt that Fannie and Freddie had to sell, which explicitly said on it, if Fannie and Freddie go into something like conservatorship or receivership, it's going to take the losses, was fully protected. So one thing I have the pleasure of doing every day is working with Neil Kashkari. So he's my boss at the Minneapolis Fed. And those who don't know, Neil ran the TARP. So Neil was in all of the meetings. And so I said to him, Neil, what was the discussion like at Fannie and Freddie about when we took, we took them over? What was the discussion like about imposing losses on subordinated debt holders? Not for a second. We never considered it for one minute. Why? Our job is to put the fire out, not to light the fire. We're not going to impose losses. Well, hold on here, Neil. Because sometimes people will come up and ask me this. Subordinated debt is not like deposits. You can't run subordinated <laughs> debt. You know? So what, what, what were you worried about? What were you worried about? Anyone who's a fixed income holder, debt holder, comes in the United States with some sense they're going to be protected. The minute you tell folks that they're going to lose their money, even if you told them that before, anything they have that's liquid, they're going to take out of the bank immediately. Even if you're not going to impose losses on deposits, immediately. Okay, so we have one bit of evidence in the United States about this is going to work. We have evidence, bail and debt, which is under the same exact regime. This TLAC thing is something that was sponsored by the Financial Stability Board. It's not a U.S. creation. We have these bail and debt, and we talked about it this morning. So there's two cases of bail and debt. So I'm actually changing my talk uh, based on the information I had this morning. I don't want to claim that I'm an expert on it. So normally what I used to say was, in almost all cases in Europe where they've had opportunity to bail in folks, they haven't, right? So three out of four cases in Italy, they haven't. And I used to say, well, there were exceptions, like Cyprus, where they did that. So what did I learn today? Okay, right, you do that in Cyprus, guess what happens? You lose your career. <laughs> That's what happens. They go after the independence of the central bank. We just heard this morning, those are your two options. Don't do it, which they did in Italy. They had a lot of good reasons why. Well, the bail-in debt holders were retail. The bail-in holders didn't were, um, now they're saying that they were, um, there was fraud. They shouldn't have been sold this stuff. I mean, that's why there's a book called This Time It'll Be Different, right? That's because at every time there's a story about why people shouldn't do it. And I thought the discussion this morning was perfect. If you're going to impose losses of someone of a financial institution, there's a huge constituency that's going to lose, there's a constituency that's going to lose money. They know that, and they're very motivated to work with elected officials to make sure it doesn't happen. Nobody's in favor of bailouts. You're not gonna, that's not going to pull very high, but it's very diffuse, and it's not the same thing. It's a very classic sort of uh, 
uh, set of principles around who's going to be affected. So in Europe, it hasn't worked. Now I know it really hasn't worked, right? Because quote, unquote, when it worked, it's never going to happen there again. In the United States, it hasn't worked. And everything we're doing in the United States is contingent on this working. <coughs> so if you ask me, yeah. why is too big to fail still a problem? It's because we're setting ourselves up to do, we're betting heavily that the one thing that's going to work is the thing that's never worked before, it's not working now, and there's no reason for thinking it's ever going to work in the future. And I'll say, when I had the pleasure once of going to Jackson Hole recently, and Neil was at Jackson Hole, and that for those of you who don't know Jackson Hole, you know, that's the place where all the you know, conspiracy theorists get together with central bankers, and we talk about <laughs> how we're going to take over the free world, et cetera. And uh, we had the pleasure, one the real advantage of that is you get a chance to talk a lot to central bankers, m most of whom have had many more experiences than I have, and maybe even more than Neil in terms of dealing with crises, people from the IMF, et cetera. And we asked them, what do you think about TLAC? What do you think about bail-in debt? And all of them said, it's great. It's really good. Do you think it'll work? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> really? So then why did you say that it was great? It was the best we could get. It was the best we could get. So what do they mean by that? They mean that what they really want to do is, if you ask them, we agree that the measure of the total amount of total loss absorbing capacity, that total amount that they need, the 23.5% at JP Morgan, that number sounds about right to us. But if we said it needed to be equity, we, that's, gonna, that's a non-starter. So we made some of it debt, which is going to be cheaper. I guess cheaper initially. It's not going to be cheaper when you get close to the crisis, but fine. Um, and that's what we need. OK, that's going to set me up for this next one. So they'll say what we should have done, if we could have, is we would have raised equity. OK, third question. I sort of emphasized credibility. So what is the credible way? I just obviously, I, I'm, uh, I'm foreshadowing if you didn't pick that up. <laughs> equity. We need much higher equity funding in the United States. And maybe in other places too, but I'll spoke about the United States. Why? Because if you look at the history of the United States, if you take a firm into a resolution, almost always the equity holders are going to take huge hits. Almost always. There's some exceptions. Canton, Illinois, there was some protection for equity holders because of some rules. Certainly, if you don't take someone into resolution, then you're going to find a way to protect folks. But if you can take them into resolution, and they are equity holders, the history of the United States is that, in fact, they'll take hits. That's the history of it. It's not like subordinated debt. It's not like other fixed income. So uh, the question then is, how much more equity, and why is that a good idea? Because, I mean, even if equity could be credible, it might be a bad idea to raise it too high, right? Maybe the costs exceed the benefits. So I'm going to talk to you. I've got, we have a whole plan on the Minneapolis Fed website. Um, and it goes into excruciating detail about how we made these calculations that I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm just going to sketch it at a high level. And then maybe we can have a give and take. And if I can remember exactly how we did the calculations, I'll tell you if that's your question. But it's all, it's all in there. OK, so I'm going to start with this graph. And I hope people can see it. Um, and I guess there's no, um, OK, I'm just going to point that. Uh, okay. So we're dividing banks into two groups. There's systemically important banks, and there's non-systemically important banks. That's going to be on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is asset size. Um, so we're going to start by saying all banks that are greater than $250 billion are going to have to hold equity. Risk, this is risk. These are all risk-weighted numbers. We've got uh, leverage ratio numbers, too, that are equivalent. But I'm just, I'm just going to stick with uh, risk-weighted. Um, that all banks that are greater than $250 billion are going to have to hold 23.5% equity. I'm going to repeat that. With 23.5% equity. So for a lot of banks, this is going to be three times what they're holding now. So this is not sort of just uh, incremental change. It's going to be a big change for them. Um, what is the framing of this? How, where do these numbers come from? So at a high level, what we did, uh, wherever we could, was just use the same analytical framework that the Board of Governors used and all, all the central banks and finance uh, ministries used around the world in coming to these calculations. We say that there's benefits and costs, and we're going to try to get those things to be in alignment. So what's the benefits of higher capital? The benefits of higher capital in this framework, which we just accepted, is avoiding a crisis. So if you avoid a crisis, that's a benefit. So how do you figure that out? There's a probability of a crisis, and then there's a cost of a crisis. So we work off of the, well, how do we figure out what the probability of a crisis is? There's been a history of crises. 
right? So we know what the unconditional chance of a crisis is. There's data about how much equity funding banks have during those crises. So we have a sense of how equity funding <coughs> is related to the chance of having a crisis. So we just, this is the same way that, quote unquote, this is how everyone does it. Let me just say right now, thank God we've only had a small number of crises, right? I'm not in favor of more crises. But it's true, for this calculation, you would like to have 5,000 crises, right? <laughs> you wouldn't want to have 90 crises. The fact is, we've got 90 crises. Right? And I've talked to some folks here who are in central banks or have had positions. You know, when you're working at a central bank, you don't have the luxury of saying, you know something, I only have 90 crises, I can't make this calculation. You have to make the calculation, right? We're, uh, it's a little bit like being a surgeon, right? I mean, you don't have the luxury of saying, you know something, more basic research before I operate on you. I mean, no, you really have to decide what you're going to do at the time. So we look at, we know from this crisis database what's the chance of having a crisis. We know how it's linked to that. There are estimates of how costly a crisis is. And that calculation is how we figure out what the benefits of any given level of capital is. I'm using capital really equity funding. What's the cost? So the cost is if you raise equity funding, then there's some chance, depending on what your view of, uh, of, of the pass-through of Miller and Digliani, right? You might think there's no problem. You can raise equity all you want. It doesn't make a difference. Banks have to fund themselves. It's all sort of equals out. <laughs> We're going to take the view that some amount of the higher cost of equity is going to pass through, and banks are going to make less loans, and less loans is going to be less economic growth. So we actually use the Federal Reserve Bank uh, US model, the Furbis model. I don't know if you see this. This is, this is the macro model workhorse that is used at the Federal Reserve for doing policy analysis and thinking about macro. And we've got, we've got a DSG model, et cetera. This one's available on our website. Anyone can use it. So what we do is we raise interest rates in that model um, based on what higher equity would do. And we say, what's future growth look like? And future growth is gonna be lower. So that's, that's the comparison we're making here. So when I'm talking about the cost of our plan, it's the cost, it's less growth in the future. And when I'm talking about the benefits of our plan, it's a uh, lower chance of a crisis. Is that clear? That's not a framework we made up. That's the framework that the Financial Stability Board used. That's what the Basel Committee uses. That's, that's how they do this. And so we're, you know, it, um, so you can't, you can't sit, you, if, you're, uh, if you're a central banker and you're using this framework for your own setup of how you're doing your regulations, you sort of can't turn around now and say, oh, I don't like this framework. Uh, so what do we find? We find that using that framework, uh, the best equity, um, the, 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 the case at which marginal costs equal marginal benefits is at 22% risk weighted. But since JP Morgan Chase was at 23 and a half under the initial proposal, we thought, well, fine, that's close enough. That's close enough for government work. So that's where we got 23 and a half for, right? So, so that's, that's where every, all these banks that are greater than 250 are gonna have to hold 23 and a half percent risk rate, regardless of whether they're deemed systemic or not. And I'll explain where that's coming from. Why 250 billion? That was the cutoff in the United States. We had already decided that 250 billion was something where we're gonna treat banks differently. And again, uh, let me just say, if you came back to me and you said, you know something, Feldman, 250 sounds like it's wrong, I think it's 375. I agree. Right? I'm ready to concede on some of these things. Uh, if you tell me it's not 23 and a half, it's 22, fine. Okay, 22. There's a lot of margins of error around here. But the key part is that capital, if we want to get, if we want to optimize and have benefits and equal costs, then we want to have it to be higher. Okay, so that's everybody going across the 250 line. Now, under our plan, we're gonna tell the Treasury Secretary, you have to go and look at every bank holding company, you have to tell <coughs> it whether or not they're systemic or not. And again, we're gonna use the existing framework. There's an existing framework, an existing set of variables that the, that the US, that you look at, that deem the level of systemicness of an institution that's borrowed from the international framework. And we're gonna to say to the Treasury Secretary, you must deem everybody every year whether they're systemic or not. Whether you're, if you're big, you're gonna to have to hold more capital, more equity. If you're systemic, when this plan goes in, you're gonna to have to face a surcharge on top of the 23 and a half, right? And what we did was we come up with a total of 38%. So by the time we're done, if you remain systemic and, uh, and you're above 250, or, or no, I'm sorry, if you're systemic at all, then you're gonna face, uh, a, your equity funding's gonna be 38%. And people hear that and they say, wow, that's, you're taking us back to the 1870s. That's, you know, we don't, Nobody has equity funding at that level. Where does that number come from? That's the point at which 
total benefits and total costs are the same. So it's not on the margin. You're still losing, you know, your, each additional amount of equity is going to be less beneficial than the cost, but the total amount is the same. And that would drive in our calculations the chance of a bailout down, to the, a chance of a crisis down to 10%. So that's where that's coming from. You know, in our mind, that's going to be a sufficient amount of uh, pressure on the largest inst on these institutions that they're actually going to move from being systemic to non-systemic. So we're not only going to have them have more equity funding, but whatever is making them systemic, maybe it's the uh, subsidiaries they have, maybe it's the complexity of their operations in other ways, they're going to change that and move over. That's, that's the essence of it. That's the essence of our plan. Much higher equity funding based on benefits and costs with the idea that we're going to drive institutions so that they're no longer systemic. And I'll make one other comment about it. So in the US, there is the authority uh, from uh, a group of regulators together where they can deem someone to be systemic, right? So in the US, you can be deemed to be systemic, uh, either by law, by your asset size, or if you're a non-bank, <coughs> then you get this designation. The one nice thing about our plan, but so you get to deemed to be systemic, but you're never deemed to be not systemic. You see what I mean? Nobody has to make an affirmative decision and say, you know something, I've decided today that you're not systemic. Under this plan, we're gonna require the Treasury Secretary to do that. So they have to go out, they must under law, and if they don't, then there's gonna be this higher capital charge. So it's gonna force people to go ahead and make this assessment. So that's, that's the banking part of it. There's other parts too, but I think it's sufficiently complicated already that I'll just leave it at that. The other part of our plan is what about shadow banks, right? Ideally, what you would like to do is you'd like to say shadow banks that have a similar risk profile to banks ought to hold the same amount of equity. In the US, it's very complicated because we're all under different regulatory schemes. So what we did was we've got a, there's some uh, theoretical work that tries to show you how would you make the funding costs of shadow banks the same as banks. We use that to sort of propose that we would have a tax on leverage for shadow banks. And this just shows you what that would look like. Uh, I'm just going to skip over that. Other than to say, typically we get a question, what about shadow banks? So that's how we would address <laughs> shadow banks. Shadow banks would have a tax on their leverage that would be sort of functionally equivalent to make their cost of funds the same as it would be for these banks if the banks were at 23.5%. So I'm going to repeat, before I get to my fourth question, I'm going to repeat where the journey we've been on together. Right? So the first issue is credibility. Whatever you're going to do, if you're going to say, if you're going to stand up in a room like this, and you're going to say, uh, and you're going to replace where, you know, it's Min Minsky's uh, 100th birthday or 100 years, yeah, 100 years since the birth. So, you know, you're going to need to stand up, you're going to need to be credible. You can't propose something that thinks too big to fail that doesn't change the reality at a time of a crisis. It's just not credible, it's not going to work. Dodd-Frank and the related sort of things, we don't think is credible. In particular, we don't think... The key part about how they're going to recapitalize banks, we don't think that's credible. We don't think it's going to work. There's no evidence going to work. The people who propose it don't think it's going to work. Um, so it's really, it's, uh, it's sort of an orphan, as far as I can tell. Uh, we'll see, you know, and the experience to date in Europe has been that it doesn't work. What would work? Higher equity funding. That's, that's the thing that seems like it can absorb losses. Try to argue about why, if you look at costs and benefits, you should be in the neighborhood of what we're talking about. One, one point, so this work came out at the end, the initial work came out at the end of 17. And during 18, there was a bunch of, there were, not, but there were several academic pieces of work that were totally unrelated to us. There was one in the American Economic Review, which is sort of a very prestigious journal, that came out and said equity funding at the exact same levels as ours. Sort of unrelated, you know, we read it, we read it at the same time everyone else did. There's been work at the Board of Governors by staff there, you know, who are, um, get to do independent research that has equity funding at very similar levels to ours. There's work at think tanks. So the subsequent work has been that we should have much higher equity uh, than we have today. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm gonna take one final question and I'll, we'll open it up for questions, which is, are we heading in the right direction? So hey, Feldman, you just came here, you talked about the plan. People will usually say, well, is, there a lot of, is your plan getting any traction? Well, I guess I don't need to tell you necessarily that the answer is no, a resounding no. Uh, and in fact, uh, I would think it's fair to say that we're moving in the opposite direction. Again, I'm going to repeat, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of anyone else at the Federal Reserve System. Um, and I'm going to, I apologize, I normally um, find it both insulting and boring when someone reads a slide to me, but I'm actually going to read a slide to you. So I hope you're okay.
So no, we're heading in the wrong direction. So this is, uh, this is I'm just gonna read it to you. This is, this, is, this is with regard to proposals that just uh, got issued for comment from the Board of Governors. There were two proposals. One was basically um, uh, changing, this, changing the frequency at which living wills had to be produced. And related, there was gonna be changes in how foreign banking operate, foreign banking organizations who operate in the US, how they're gonna be regulated. So that's the context for this. It says the proposals go beyond the requirements of S2155. That was a bill that said we, someone mentioned it this morning, that we have the authority now to, if we want to, uh, we can relax aspects of the supervision for these large institutions. The proposals go beyond the requirements of that law and weaken important regulatory requirements for banking institutions with total assets above 250 billion. At a time when large banks have comfortably achieved the post-crisis requirements and are providing ample credit to the economy and enjoying robust profitability, I see no change in the financial environment that would require us to weaken protections that are vital to a safe and sound financial system and ensure that large banks and not taxpayers are on the hook. Right, so that's the direction we're going. Who said this? Lael Brainerd, she's a governor of the Federal Reserve System. She's dissented on a couple of occasions now for things that the Board of Governors have done that I think, uh, according to Governor Brainerd's own words, would move us in the wrong direction. At a time when we should not be relaxing what we're doing, I think Governor Brainerd has been a profile and courage about trying to stand up and not move us. So we're talking about increasing equity funding and the direction that the Board right now is to move not just increasing, but trying to figure out how we're going to relax what we're doing. Again, I don't speak on behalf of Governor Brainerd. These are public statements that she made. I just want to associate myself with them. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read one more thing. Um, so this is with regard to our formal regulation. One thing I didn't talk about was you know, we have a very um, extensive series of stress tests that we put in place. And again, the idea is are we going to move, to, you know, are, uh, we going to move towards more regulation? So this was an op-ed that was published on April 9th from a guy named Tim Clark, who used to run the stress testing program at the Board of Governors. So Tim said, um, and there's been some relaxation of the stress test, he said, after nine years of pinch, pitched battle with the banks over stress tests, the Fed has decided to retreat, and in that process weakened its capacity to hold them accountable for dangerously bad practices. Will it hold the line at preserving effectiveness and stringency of the quantitative assessment. This is the assessment we make about how well they manage their risk. We should all hope so, but given the Fed Board's propensity to make uh, unforced errors that weaken effective post-crisis reforms, we should not be optimistic. So I just think we're at a real, so Tim doesn't work at the Board anymore either, uh, as you can see, um, and he wouldn't, if, he's, if he did the work there, that would be a short career, it would be a bad career move. Um, and I want to associate myself with Tim's remarks here too, uh, personally. Again, not speaking on behalf of the board, because we're really headed in the wrong direction. Um, if you take our analysis seriously, the problem we have is that we don't have enough equity. We don't have enough stringency. So the idea that we're now going to be moving to relax that just seems like it's completely uh, a misguided effort. And uh, you know, it's disappointing that uh, 10 years after the crisis, we're so far removed that we're sort of already already heading there. So. Uh, those were my uh, prepared remarks, so I'm happy to take questions. Chair, I think there's a microphone, or is it a new thing? I'm happy to use your mic. Hello, hello, aren't you? Well, I guess I don't know how to answer that other than to say what we tried to model was the estimate for how they would increase loans. So if they're going to increase the price of loans, they're going to make fewer loans, and that's how it would pass through to the economy. So, there's so you're assuming interest rates are going to go up, whatever they are now. Yeah, we, assu we, we assume. From 4 to 10. Uh, no, so I don't. That's what it will have to happen. That's what will have to happen. No, I don't think that's what would happen. So we're assuming that there's a hack. Because what you want to do eventually is to get a, a yeah. bank return on equity that, that will cause people to invest in banks. Yeah, yeah. So I think Miller was on the whole point is that they're going to be safer, right? Well, so but, but that's not the 
Yeah, yeah. So we, we're assuming a half. We assume that half of the extra cost of equity is going to pass through to higher loans. We don't assume there's a full pass through, which I think is roughly where the literature is at. So there's some folks who are saying that some of the literature said that there's no pass through at all, and some says it's 100. percent So we're saying half. I mean, I, it's hard to answer your question without some sort of modeling or something, right? So I mean, what we did was we have our assumptions. They're totally transparent. We're showing how we model it. Um, you know, if other people have another take about how it would work. We're happy to hear it. But I think just sort of asserting, well, it's going to be more than that is sort of, it, it's hard to figure out how to respond, right? Yeah, I'm, uh, Jim? Sure, I'm curious what Jim says. <laughs> um, very nice. So I'm looking at your, your uh, table or chart number one there, and I'm thinking I've got a $960 billion bank, and I'm de designated as systemically important. I think what I should do is create four $240 billion banks right. and go under the current regulation. I'm only going to have to hold 8 to 10 percent capital or something like that. Right. So isn't this effectively a proposal to break up uh, the big banks? Um, so I think the one reason why I don't think I would call it a proposal to break up the big banks <laughs> is, is, is there's twofold. No, I'm not going to be cute about it. So, so one is, a proposal to break up the big banks is going to have to come forward and say exactly which <coughs> banks and how they're going to do it. Typically, that's what those proposals look like. And we actually have a discussion in the plan about that. Um, there might be other ways of doing it, but typically they'll say uh, you have to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So the one difference is they're going to to be to not be deemed systemically important regardless of the size. They're going to have to have certain attributes, and the treasury we're giving some power to the treasury secretary to make that assessment. So it's so it's. At that point, they're not going to be systemically important by whatever criteria they're going to use. And the idea would be that, yeah, we actually think that having being 240 billion and not being systemically important, there has to be some size bank, there has to be some size at which this higher equity funding doesn't kick in. So there, you know, there's different ways of doing it. We thought about not having as much of a cliff. You know, that's another issue. Do you want to have it be more graduated? For this proposal, we decided to keep things really simple, so it's not time varying. There's lots of things, there's lots of, uh, as, you, as you pointed out in your model, you can make things more complicated or less complicated. Because it's less complicated, it's sort of less true, it has more faults, and it's less true to what um, people might actually want to do. But it has this, it has, it's a little easier to explain. But I think if you're telling me, would we be better off with four $240 billion banks that are not systemically bit, uh, important relative to one $900 billion that is systemically important, we're making the assessment that yes, we'd be better off. Yeah. Or I. Yeah, I'm not a banker, but I've been watching this uh, for 72 years. We seem to be in the business of war, and I haven't heard of the discussions that the Federal Reserve are involved in. in in building equity in peacetime activities rather than war activities. And I was wondering, it, it seems to me that a stable investment into North Korea, who's got a huge amount of mineral wealth, would be a, a good investment to build equity for a bank. I, I just wanted to see if I could get a comment on war, uh, as we've seen for 86 years, versus peace, which we might have a chance to do under this present uh, interesting character. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a metaphor or, 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 or an exact, exact question. I'm not trying to make fun. I just, I'm not sure. I, 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 to I totally get it. I thought you were going to say something different, which was, a, um, which was, should we be building it? Should we be building up? When is the right time to do this? Uh, so I'll, how about this? I'm going to change your, your question if you don't mind. Um, so is this a good time to try to do a plan like this? So I should say one thing is in the plan, it's going to be graduated. Like we're not going to say that people need to get to 23 and a half in a year. We're going to give them some period of time over which to do it. Um, and right now actually would be the time to do it, right? So the, when you want to be raising equity is in a good time, not when we're getting closer. So this seems like as good a time as it could be to try to move this forward. Was there a question over here? Yeah. I was just wondering. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. I was actually pointing to the guy on the side. Would you say that a one-sentence summary of your presentation would be, next time will not be different? Uh, next time will not be different. Uh, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Under the current regime, next time will not be different. But I, but I don't want you to take that away because, uh, I mean, I want you to take that away, but I also want you to, I guess what I really 
can I, I'll give you a different one sentence summary, which is um, we have an opportunity. Uh, I have to. I, I'm, I'm folding under the pressure, but I'll maybe it'll be two sentences. We have an opportunity right now to make sure that it will be different. That's the important part. Is that it's not people will say there's nothing we can do, or that the reason why I mean, there's a reason why the plan is formulated the way the current plan is formulated the way it is. At a time in which we just went through the great financial crisis, there was a decision that was made that we did not want to impose too many costs on banks. And so that's why it's debt and equity and not equity. That's why. It's because equity is cheaper. Now, I mean, I've heard other people talk about other reasons. None of them make any sense. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. And I guess the question <coughs> is, um, that's a question of costs and benefits. And if that leaves you vulnerable to a future crisis, I think it's really, really, um, it's, it's surprising to me, but I think people are really underestimating the cost of what a crisis is. Crises are really, really, really costly in lots of ways. And we're just talking about GDP here, but I think you know, socially and culturally and all that, if you want to try to monetize that, it would be even bigger. Yeah, is there any place in the world where this regime actually exists? Uh, Any time period? Yes, absolutely. If you look at if you look at equity hold it, if you look at equity in banks in the United States before there was as many guarantees as there were, it was much higher. Like what year? Uh, in the nineteenth century. Seventy. In the nineteenth century. Okay, and that was a period of real financial Well, no, <laughs> I get no, I get your point, right? That, that, but that, but hold on, but why was that the case? That's because there wasn't a central bank that was functioning. That's not because of this. But I don't think you want to confuse the two. There were two no, things. Okay, but wait a minute. Then your answer to my question is no. That under this financial system, yeah. with central banks, and we agree everywhere in the world there's yeah. central banks in it, yeah. there is no banking system with these other things. Yeah, I think that's basically true. So how do you project? I mean, you're projecting from yeah, yeah. data agree. that's a long way from yeah, yeah. what anybody is actually No, I, let me just say, so I told where's you. your confidence here? So the confidence is trying to do different simulations of it. I, I agree. So what you, data that's nowhere close to what? Very, no, no, fair enough. And then but let me just turn the tables here. So you're extremely confident that we should keep the system that we have today that just produced the financial crisis. Well, I'm going to get to hear from you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it was a financial crisis. Oh, I think I can make a powerful Okay, <clears throat> good. Well, that seems pretty, uh, I mean, I'm, you should go for that, and that should be, I, we should all we'll take that as, as seriously as it's in the terms of, as it needs to be. But I'll just say, it's one thing to take shots at this. And I, and I think people should, because I think if your point is, we have to extrapolate from not much data, it's a different world, you're totally right. I mean, everyone has to do that. The decision today has been, what we're gonna do is make marginal changes. What we're gonna do is make changes on the margin to try to avoid the crisis we just had, and have crisis like that. That's a bet. So I guess I'm willing to take the bet that as we ratchet up equity holdings, we'll get a chance to find out whether or not banks stop lending, whether banks disappear, whether all the banks run away, and all that kind of stuff. I'm skeptical myself that that's going to be the result, but we'll get a chance, and we do it in a graduated way so that we're not just sort of playing with fire and throwing the US economy, just sort of experimenting. But let me just say, if you don't want to do this, then what you're saying is you're really confident that the system that has not worked to date is going to continue to work. So if that's the bet you want to take, I'm with you. I'm there, there to take the other side. Yeah. I appreciate that. What is your view uh, about macroprudential uh, regulation and oversight and whether, in your opinion, that can uh, reduce the needed equity level? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, and it gets a little bit to sort of the challenge with the data. So, um, there has been a decent amount of work trying to think through which of the various macro uh, tools seem like they're going to be most effective. I think, uh, you know, some of the evidence to date around things like changing loan to value ratios and things like that suggests that, you know, it's not clear that those are particularly effective. So if you have the view that those are not that effective, then it wouldn't really change this, right? I, I think the jury's out, though. I don't think we really know how effective those things are or they're not. I would say Stan Fisher, when he was at the Fed, um, was particularly concerned that the U.S. didn't have any of those uh, really at our disposal. We really have much fewer kind of macro tools than other banks, other entities do. 
we've got some stuff we can do on leverage around, um, uh, you know, like uh, reg fee and stuff like that, but not much. So, you know, I do want to take seriously that those things can have effect, but I think it's a real open discussion now about how effective those would be. And how much time, more time do you have? That's one, more question. one more question. Okay, one more question. Very naive question. What, under the 38% of the 23%, yeah. what is the return on equity of investment in banks expected to be if they go to that? Well, I think it depends on how much risk they're going to take. Uh, for vanilla bank, I mean, for, oh. can you give me a range? What? what is, he was talking about people, about it. As a slide. Yeah, I, th I think. It, I mean, I think it depends. Like, are they going to end up looking like utilities? Then you can sort of use like a utility model and that would be the return. But I think, I mean, what's the risk-adjusted return going to be? I think that was my point. That yeah. that's the thing that matters. Is, is having utility banks no problem? Right. I guess that's what I was sort of getting at. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem or not. I mean, there's a whole separate literature about what size would the banking system look like if it was, you know, is, is the size of the financial sector in the U.S. sort of optimal? I mean, I don't want to get too far afield, but I think those are open questions too. So I think I should wrap up? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>